ladies and gentlemen, it's the Jack and Connor Show, where we pride ourselves in bringing you the news that matters to us. This is the Jack and Connor Show. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Connor and Jack Show, where we have a very special guest tonight, Jeff Hawkins. May we welcome him to the set. Thank you for that outstanding round of applause. I'm very honored to be here today. Now, Jeff, before we get into the brain stuff, which I'm sure I won't understand, why don't you tell us a bit about yourself? Well, well you know, as a child, I was very interested in mobile computing and brains. I, um, I started at Palm Computing and uh, Handspring, both were developers of old handheld phones. I also studied brain theory in uh, Silicon Valley. I was very interested in that. And I graduated from Cornell with a degree in electrical engineering. From there, I met my lovely wife. We've been married for several years. And um, I wanted to really get in and study brain theory more, which is really the inner workings of everything with the brain. So I applied to MIT to do that. I was actually rejected. And um, from there, me and my wife moved to California, where I got a job at Grid Systems and worked at Intel for a little while. I actually developed a, um, what's it called, a programming language called Grid Task for um, Grid Systems. And from there, I was accepted as a full-time grad student in biophysics in the University of California, where I studied biophysics. And here we are. <laughs> How do you define intelligence? Thank you, Mr. McNeil. You know, intelligence is really measured by the capacity to remember and predict patterns in the world. And this includes things like language, math, etc. And what happens is your brain is constantly receiving patterns from the outside world. It's going to store them as memories and then make predictions by combining past information it has along with what is happening now and that's what really produces intelligence. You are very educated in this field. Can you please introduce your book? Yes, so on intelligence, it's, it's right there. It's, it's really more about understanding the brain and because of that, understanding the brain is going to be the way of the figuring out everything else. Artificial intelligence, intelligent machines. And a common misconception in the intelligence community is that intelligence is not defined by intelligent behavior. Rather, intelligence happens in your head. Behavior is actually optional. And um, prediction, not behavior, is the proof of actual intelligence. And me, myself, I'm more interested in figuring out what intelligence is than trying to replicate it in machines. And until this point, brain studies have focused on the where and when of brain activities, not the how and why. And there's, there's really nothing inherently special or magical about the brain. It's just predictions influencing your behavior, which then equates to intelligence. So it seems like prediction is very important, correct? Prediction? Prediction, yeah. Correct. So um, prediction is actually the main focus of this book. And um, where did the book go? It's right there. Right there, where you put it, sir. Oh, under your bed. I'm sorry about that. Um, so, prediction is the main focus of this book. And I argue that prediction, not behavior, is the main focus of intelligence. And um, predictability is really the, the definition of reality. And understanding that is a result of correct predictions. So, as you're understanding in your everyday lives, if you understand that Connor's glass is empty right now, and he's... If, give me the cup. If he's going like this... And he's saying, oh, there's no, there's no liquid in here. He infers that it's empty. And by predicting that, even if he had his eyes closed and he didn't feel anything going through the cup, his predictions would be correct. And therefore, that would be called understanding because he knows what's happening through his predictions. But what happens if there's irregularities in a prediction? So let's say that I walk back in this room and you two are gone. That's not what I predict. I predict that when I come back in, you, you both are going to be sitting here still present. The same would go for falling down the stairs. If you go down the stairs and you predict, oh, there's going to be a stair right here, and there's not, which I'm sure Mr. McNeil has done many times, that would be a false prediction. I and therefore, he, that. thank you. He confirms that. Therefore, that would be a false understanding. And yeah, that's another great example of this is actually in New York City when they um there was a study done when they uh, removed the train lines, the the in the air train lines, whatever you call those people in the apartments would still wake up at the times the trains used to come, even though they didn't exist anymore. And that's because your brain is predicting from past experiences 
the train's coming at this time, I'm going to wake up because it's going to be loud, when, even when it's gone. So that shows that your brain is really, prediction is fueling everything else and all your behaviors that you do. So yourself must have a huge memory to remember all this. I mean, it's not like this interview was scripted or anything. No, absolutely not. I mean, th if this was scripted, we would, we would be frauds. But, um, but what happens is our memories are not like computers in that they have to remember everything. Our memories remember the important stuff and throw out everything else. And that's because we have an auto-associative memory, which I'll come back to a lot in this hopefully short interview. Um, and what that means is our brain is constantly checking itself and giving itself feedback. And it only has to remember a part of a sequence of memories in order to recall the whole thing. So let's give us an example. If you go to the bank, uh, Mr. Allen, and you bring them a crumpled $100 bill. And actually, that's, that's great. Can you give me a crumpled $1 bill over there? Just throw it over here. Thank you. No problem. So I'm going to be an audio associate of memory. I'm going to take this crumpled $1 bill, and I'm going to smooth it out. Now I'm going to give it back to you. Now, this bill is nice and fresh, and you probably want it more now, right? It looks like it has more value. Well, that's what the audio associative memory is doing. It's taking things, and it's really organizing them and allowing them to be understood throughout the brain in an organized and sequential fashion. And now, again, they have to be recalled in sequential segments, similar to how you experience them. So if you're trying to remember your trip to Disney, you're probably not going to start thinking about the last day first. You're going to remember the first day, and then the second day, and so forth. And... As your brain is looking at these memories, you might say, well, if I'm remembering a trip to Disney in general, what's the difference between that and my trip to Disney? Well, when your brain is storing memories, it's actually storing them in invariant form, which is absurdly important in this book, which is where the version your brain is storing of a memory is not the actual version you see. It's a very generalized version. So it's just like driving a car. When you store a memory of driving the car, you're going to remember the general links, how to do it, how to turn the wheel, how to press the pedal. Not necessarily the guy flying past you 100 miles an hour on the freeway. You're going to remember a general version of this, and this allows for change in the future for variations of events. How is your brain responding to this? To the invariant memories? Yes, that big word. Invariant. Yeah, say it with me now. In... In variant. Variant. Very good. Say it all together. I did good. In variant. In variety. <laughs> Close enough. Okay. So let's use this example. Um, there's three kinds of invariant responses. One is tactile invariance. So let's say I have this bag here. Very nice bag. Thank you. And um, there's this pair of sunglasses, okay? If I put this pair of sunglasses in here and I stick my hand in here and I touch any part of those sunglasses, my brain remembers from experience that this whole thing is sunglasses. It fills in the rest of it. Just as if I'm touching this table, it feels the other side of it, and I know where it stops and ends and how big it is. Another kind is um, sensor, sensory motor invari invariance, which is knowing the sequence of actions repetitively with slight invariance, slight variations. So let's say, like again, going back to the car, I'm starting a car. It's the same thing every time. I get in. I sit down, I put the key in the hole, and I turn it. Or if you have a fancy car, you sit down, you throw the key in the other seat, you put the foot on the brake, and you hit the button. It's the same sequence, and therefore it's a sensory motor invariance memory. The last one is an audio sensory invariance memory, which is where, let's say, Connor is singing a song, or Mr. Allen is singing a song, rather, and he does it in a terrible pitch, and he sounds terrible. I'm still going to know what song it is, because I store audio in a pitch invariant form, which is where it remembers the song regardless of the pitch, and it can tell what the song is regardless of how it sounds. All right, let's stop scratching the surface. I'm ready for the juicy stuff. I'm sure all of this has to do something with the neurocortex. Can you give us a basic overview of the cortex itself? Sure, so the, the cortex itself is actually obscenely complicated, as I said before, so. No worries if you don't understand this. Just read the questions on the non-script. But the cortex covers your brain. Inside we have the old brain, and on top we have the new brain. The new brain evolved over the old brain. And it's about the size of a dinner napkin. So it's, it's actually it's about the size of a dinner napkin. And it's about the thickness of maybe a few dollars, a couple dollars, maybe five dollars in singles. 
And there is 30 billion neurons in the neocortex that we talked about before, constantly talking to each other and telling things, predicting things, storing memories. And it really has four main roles. Its first one is it's going to store sequences of patterns or memories that you happen to you in your life. Then, if you want to think about these memories before, like if I want to think about this terrible interview later, I'm going to remember them in an audio associative memory. Then, later, as I continue to live my life, I'm also going to store new memories in an invariant form, so I can take into account variabilities in them later. And lastly, all these memories are going to get stored in a hierarchy, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. And although you might think, well, understanding things via sound has to be different than touch or vision, correct? Would, would that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Incorrect. You're wrong. All of the senses have a basic algorithm that occurs throughout the cortex to remember all these things. And really, although there's different structures and sections, Everything is the same that's happening. It's the same general principle, just like an invariant form of a memory. Your neocortex is really an invariant memory, storing everything and doing everything in a similar way. And because of this, it is extremely adaptive and flexible. And when you hear something versus see something, the only difference is an output. So, for example, there's a condition, actually, that, you know, you might say for fun you know i i hear colors i see sounds that is possible by rerouting the outputs of your neocortex i'll get into it later i'm forgetting the term right now but you can hear colors it's possible by rerouting the outputs of your neocortex because of how similar all the sections are and what they're doing this seems very powerful and complicated how is this powerhouse organized um, so th this is the this is the main focus of the book. About fifty percent of the book you see right there is based on the, the structure of the neocortex. It is extremely complicated and is equivalent to trying to solve a multi-thousand piece puzzle. I might argue actually a multi-million piece puzzle. But if we bring up Figure Three right now on your screen for all of you at home, you'll see that the general concept here for all the senses is that. Information is going to flow up the cortex, and predictions are going to flow down. So as you're feeling things and seeing things, all that's going to go up, and everything that you're predicting you're going to see and hear is going to go down. In addition to that, the slow changing and high level patterns, so the idea of, I'm seeing my friend's face right now, or I'm seeing Mr. Allen's face, I've never met this guy in my life, is going to be at the top. Rather, the small, minute details that are fastly changing are going to go with the bottom. So, for example, I see his eye. I see his other eye. I see his nose. I see his mouth. For Mr. McNeil, the same thing. So, let's use vision as an example to get more specific in the senses. Let's bring up figure one right now. And this is the structure of V1 and V2 and V4 and IT, the sections of the cortex that represent vision. And... What happens in this section is at the bottom you have V1, which is the bottom layer of the cortex. And this is where all the visual input's going to come in and be seen for the first time. And what happens here is the neurons here do not know the general picture. They see eye. More specifically, they might see pupil if we're getting that specific. I think the camera's broken. Died. And we'll be right back. We're taking a quick commercial break. Hi, I'm Jeff Hawkins, author of On Intelligence. And today, and today only, for a limited time offer, you can get your own copy of On Intelligence, signed by yours truly, for just the price of three easy payments of $59.99. We hope to see you purchase this outstanding novel that covers the basics, and only the basics, very not complicated, of the human brain, intelligence, and most importantly, how it will be replicated in intelligent machines. Thank you, and I hope you purchase your own copy of On Intelligence. All right, we are back from the commercial, and here is Jeff again. Hi, folks. They didn't offer me any food. So we're hungry now. Um, but I believe we, we ended talking about V1, am I correct? Which Trump? Okay, um, let, let's quiz you. Is V1 at the top or the bottom of the cortex? Top. 
Great. Okay. No. Um. So. Again, I believe that we left off talking about the view one is the bottom part. It's talking about the specific parts of the of your vision. It is going to be at the top, and it's going to think of the bigger picture. So again, Connor's eye versus Connor's face. V1 doesn't know objects. It knows parts. Please don't make a mess in the studio with your pretzels. Actually, can I have one of those? Those look fantastic. Um, V1 doesn't know face. It knows eye. It knows... <laughs> I need a new one now. It, needs, it knows eye. It knows nose. It knows ma mouth. It knows ears. It doesn't know face. So what's going to happen is it's... Thank you. It's going to see all this, and it's going to generalize it as best it can. So it's going to say, it's going to move it up to V2. It's going to say, V2, I see an eye and a nose and ears and a mouth. And now V2 is going to say, and say, oh, I see a pair of eyes and a pair of ears incorporated into a nose and a mouth. <laughs> and now it's going to move it up to V4. I don't know why we skipped V3. It just happens. V4 then takes this and generalizes it even more. And it's going to say, well, now I see a grouping of a pair of ears and a pair of nose. And not a pair of noses. A pair of ears and a pair of eyes. And it is coming along with another nose and a mouth. And it's going to push this up to IT. And IT is the one that's going to finally say, I'm seeing a face. And it's going to name it. It's going to say face. And it's going to store it in what kind of memory? What kind of way? Top. No. <laughs> bottom. The, bottom. It's not a location. It's a oh. word. It's, it rhymes with, um, dim parient. Dim parient. Oh. In the variant. In oh, variant. Oh, like in in variant. mental. What? Continue. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's going to store it in an in a variant memory. So, from now on, it's not going to remember Connor's face. It's going to remember face. Okay, so that's how V1 works. Well, now you might say, let's get specific with the V1 specifically. How is it seeing all these things? And how is it determining eye, eye, nose, mouth, eye, ear, ear? What's actually happening is every few seconds, or every second, excuse me, your face is making... Excuse me, we're on a set. I prefer for you this to is, the day. This uh, is... We're shut, by the way. <laughs> You were We've been doing this for 20 years. I think we know what we're doing. Yeah, so, so, can you just continue with your clearly, book? Clearly. Okay, just get back to your interview, please. Yeah. So, every second, your eye is making what's called a cicada. And what that is, is as I'm looking at Jack, I'm not actually looking at Jack's nose. As hard as I try, even if I'm staring, if I think I'm staring at Jack's nose, I'm not. Please don't stare at my nose. Um, I apologize. I, sorry if that it made you okay. if, if I made you uncomfortable. Um. I'm making cicades, which is where if I look at your nose for one second, I have actually looked at every part of your face twice. That is very interesting. So I have looked at your ear, your ear, your eye, your eye, your nose, and your mouth, and everything in between to determine that's a face. He's not an alien. Once that stops and it determines it's a face, it's called a fixation. And that's basically how the visual section of the cortex works. And... As this all is happening, you might say, well, how does this influence the other senses? So, I'm seeing all these things, and I get to the fact that I see Mr. McNeil's face. What happens when I feel something? So, inputs from other senses are actually going to drive predictions in all your other ones. So, let's say I'm walking through the forest with Mr. McNeil, and I'm walking, I'm walking, I'm looking straight ahead, and I feel, feel a poke in my leg. Uh, before I even see anything, my brain is going to run a bunch of predictions and say, it's probably a stick. And when I look down and I see a stick, I'm going to go, okay, it was a stick. When I look down and I see a bear, that's when it becomes a problem. That can be very dangerous. It, it can mm. be. And that, that's why you, you feel fear, because it's not what you're predicting. Mm. Oh, that's very interesting. Uh -huh. Wow, it cannot be broken more down than that, right? It's very complicated, though. Right, it probably can't be broken down more, right? You think it can't? This, is, this has to be it, right? Going, we've gone up and down, now we've gone left and right. This has to be it. Correct? Correct, Amundo. You could correct Amundo? Mm -hmm. You would say that's correct? I would say that's correct. Wrong! Incorrect. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Oh, he yeah. gets it. Okay, let's bring yeah. up figure six. Wow, that is very big. 
Yeah, so now we're going to get even more complicated. We're going to go up and down again. So mm. each section is now going to be broken down into, I believe, one, two, three, four, five sections. And one of those is broken down into three subsections. These are called micro columns or cortical columns. And these are the most basic. This is where we're going to stop. This is the most basic unit of prediction in the cortex. And it is estimated that there are 700 million micro columns in the cortex. These tiny little things that are the basic units of prediction. And each layer of these things is going to actually do something different. Each micro column, now we're not talking about a common cortical algorithm anymore. Each cortical column is going to do something completely different because it has different cells and axons that are again responsible for these different actions. And this more specific breakdown of the cortex is really what allows, actually going against what I just said, for a common cortical algorithm because you might say, well this, if you look at this thing as a whole, each layer might be doing something different. This single thing, if you look at um, figure six, this whole layout is happening again and again and again and again throughout the cortex. It's happening again and again and again. Very repetitive. It's extremely repetitive. Thank you, Mr. McNeil. See, you're starting to grasp the oh, concept. Thank you. Because there is a common cortical algorithm in the cortex that allows for the same thing to be done for different senses at different times and in different scenarios. And so these layers are very much more complicated than the other ones, as you see on the chart. And the flow is also more complicated. It's not straight up and down input and prediction. The information flowing up is going to take a very direct route, as we've seen before. If you look at figure seven really quick, everything going straight up wow. is pretty basic. No, this is pretty basic. Don't say wow. Okay. Say, okay, you understand this, right? Very plain. Yes, yeah, very plain. Now, yeah. if we go down, this is where it gets bad. You see, oh. n yes, there you go. Down now, down. all the prediction is actually at the very top going to branch out and then go down at some point. We don't actually see where it ends. It's going to go all the way across and basically be going down, 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 down into every single column possible. And often there are more axons in these cortical columns going down the hierarchy instead of up. And it shows that prediction is really what's more important than the input going on in these different algorithms. And now if we bring up the most complicated one I can think of diagram in the book. Let's bring up figure 10. If you'd like to find figure 10 in the book, this is where everything is broken down as far as possible. Can you count to 10? Yes, I can. He can indeed count to 10. Um, we're going to start at the bottom. Let's start at L6. This is, again, kind of similar to V1, but we're going to break it down even more. L6 is going to contain single cells that activate when they believe the thing they're representing is happening. So if it's predicting something and it thinks, let's like, let's use a, uh, a song for an example. Um, think of a song, Mr. McNeil. Mm -hmm. Happy birthday. Great. Great example. If we go happy birthday to you, the next thing the brain expects and layer six cells are going to expect, it's going to go ha for happy birthday to you again. And that's what it's going to then fire a neuron or an axon as the cell itself, it's going to say, I think I got it. I think I know what's going to happen next. And it's going to send these outputs up to layer four, as you can see in the diagram. Layer five, we're not going to worry about for now. Not very important, doesn't do much. And what happens is, this is actually a little side note here. Do, do you know, what's daydreaming, Mr. McNeil? Mr. Dream McNeil daydreams a lot. Dreaming during the day. I do that a lot when I get distracted. How to distract a lot. Is there a bird outside the window? A bird? Where? Exactly. Uh, I state my case. So um, what happens is when these layer six cells are shooting there, what they think is happening back to layer four, it can take these inputs and actually cause our predictions to become the input. And that's where you can play through scenarios in your mind. That's what's happening. You're saying, I predict this is going to happen. You're... Layer six cells are going to match. It's going to say, I got it. I got the solution. And it's going to send it back up to layer four. And this is the concept of daydreaming. It's an endless loop of self for where did the banana come from? Oh, yeah. Hot dog. 
Um, but okay. where, where was that bird, Mr. Kaboo? I don't know. I, I Mr. I Mr. Hawkins. I have no idea. Can Mr. we please Hawkins. get back to the interview, please? Hmm? Can we please get back to the interview? Sure, why not? So, again, that's the concept of daydreaming, that this is an endless loop happening over and over again. Excuse me. My mom's calling me. Can you please take the mic? Oh. I have to take an important call. No, you don't, we don't have calls during interviews, Mr. McKinney. AJ. Oh. I mean, this is how we run our studio. Who's AJ? Jack Hello? Hawkins. This is how we run our studio here. Uh -huh. You're going to have to... Yeah. Give him a second. Okay. We're going to cut to our second commercial break for the evening. I don't know why I'm saying that, not you. And we'll be right back. What am I saying? This is a Cortex cushion. Everyone loves Cortex in the tri-state area. Let's go take a lay on it. This really relaxes my Cortex. Go buy one now for the price of $100. Let's see how our customers like this Cortex cushion. See, I really like the Cortex cushion because it's very comfortable and soft and it relaxes my Cortex. Thank you for buying a Cortex cushion at this local dealership mm. in Huntington. Have a great day. Mm. I'm broke now. Oh, we are back from our commercial break and let's get back to with Mr. Jeff. How's your mother, Mr. McDale? Hey, My hey. mother is doing fine. She is racing corgis out in the Middle East. Racing corgis in the Middle East? Yes. I've never heard of that much. Does that make good money out there? Oh, it makes very great money. <laughs> does, her, does her near cortex understand that she might predict that her corgi may or may not win? Oh, my corgi will win. Uh huh. Your neocortex is predicting that. Yes, my corgi's name is Francis. <laughs> <laughs> your corgi's name is Francis. Francis, indeed. Thank you for that. What? It's a bit dry in the room. Okay, so, yeah, I, I, okay, I, I, so we've covered layer six, layer five. We don't need to talk about layer four. Now let's get to two, three A, and three B. These all fall fall into the same category in this chart here in Figure Ten that I believe is still on the screen. I oh, it's still on the screen. Fantastic. So let's start with layer two. Layer two is your specific name cells that we've talked about a lot. And that, again, these patterns and sequences need to be named in order to access them in the future. So again, face. This is where the naming specifically is going to happen. 3A is your expected input, what you expect to happen. So another form of prediction. And 3B is your unexpected input. So when I look at Mr. McNeil's face and I see I where I think I'm going to see mouth. That's where it would happen in 3B. If I see I where I'm supposed to see I, it's going to occur in 3A. And finally, the top layer, L1, is where it's going to take in a ton of information from higher cortical regions, like the, um, the thalamus. Other things like that. That's going to come in from different sectors and fill in for the information that is needed to continue doing information throughout the layers. So, these axons are going to fire in anticipation, not in delay or after the fact to what's actually happening. And when multiple predictions could be correct, let's say I predict I'm on the road and I'm driving again. We're going to use a lot of driving algorithms. I'm driving and I predict that there's a guy on my right. He's going really fast. I predict that either he's a great driver or he is going to crash. And I could have multiple predict corrections. Per correct predictions and what's going to happen is we're going to use bottom up and top bottom down and top bottom up top down matching to predict what's actually going to happen officially so whatever is the closest in relation to the cortical columns it's probably what's going to happen if i have two if i have a prediction that he's a really good driver and it's close to this prediction here and the input that's happening that's probably what's actually happening we're back. Continue Sorry with Sorry about that, folks. There was a technical difficulty. Now we are back. Hi. Hi. What, what, what am I talking about? Uh, how am I able to learn things? How are you able to learn? Great question. So, the, these memories and sequences that we've been talking about, again, he just walked, I think. And, um, you don't think about walking. You just tell yourself to walk. No. So, you're not thinking, put X foot there and put X foot there and bend X muscle and do this. So, as you repeat these sequences, they actually move down the cortical hierarchy and they become easier and easier to recognize. So visually, for example, I'm so used to seeing face, that's probably occurring in V1 instead of IT at this point. I'm not so worried about the main concept, at, at the little details. I'm thinking about the main concept, which is face. Same thing with walking. I'm not thinking left foot, right foot. I'm thinking walk, which would be a, a motor command instead of vision. But 
in that case, is moving down and down and down. And where all this is happening is, well, what happens when it gets to the bottom? Where are these things stored in long-term storage? And that would be the hippocampus. Can you say hippocampus? It's a very funny word. Hippocampus. Very good. And without one, you are unable to make new memories. And it is actually located, excuse me, that was incorrect a second ago, it's located at the top of the cortical hierarchy. So as everything's rising up and all these inputs, it's storing them up in the hippocampus. Like a pyramid. Like it's a, rising up. Like a pyramid. Mm. Thank you. Like, like the food pyramid. Like a social pyramid. Okay, I guess. Like a hierarchy. Mm. Understood? Mm. Understood. So being located at the top, it allows you to remember and understand all of this new information that's constantly going in. So, a fun fact, the more you know, do you think you remember more or less? Fun fact moment. Mm. Less. Less, correct! That's the first I question fun, you got right tonight. So what happens is, as you remember more, pretend you're an old person, right? And you go to your, uh, your senior, you're a senior citizen, you go to your, your granddaughter's concert. How well do you think you're going to remember that concert in a week? Well or not well? Mm. Not well, well at all, sir. Good. And why do you think that is? Because he's old. And he's going to die soon. <laughs> kind of. And his brain's not, not working anymore. Kind of. The normal go. context is broken down. They're not working anymore. Kind of. So, what happens is, your, hippo, your hippocampus is only store. Yes. Your hippocampus is hippocampus. only... Your hippocampus... <laughs> hippocampus is only storing... I'm up with the hippocampus. Your hippocampus is only storing what new important memories are that you haven't experienced before. So in your childhood as a senior citizen, you probably have gone to several concerts or been in several concerts. So your granddaughter's concert is not all that different to you. And it might not even make it up to your hippocampus because it's saying your brain is telling it. We've seen this before. We don't need to remember it. Her first concert, you might remember because that's, that's a landmark and you might remember that. But the idea of a repeating concert or a repeating event that you've experienced a bunch of times is not going to get stored as a memory. And that's why new things are so exciting to us because they get shot up to the hippocampus really fast. Wow. And it all gets remembered really clearly. The hippocampus. Holy macaroni, this seems almost... <laughs> Holy macaroni, this seems almost impossible to replicate in a computer. Please tell us more after these following messages. Is your hippocampus failing you? Get a cat, stupid. Come here. Come here. How are you doing? I rest my case. For more information about how cats can improve the condition of your hippocampus, please visit hippocampus.com. Hi, I'm Jack and Connor, and we are back live on television. Um, we <laughs> left off on how impossible it was to replicate in a computer. <laughs> what computer can you use this for? Does That's... it have to be a Dell, a Windows, or an <laughs> Apple computer? None of the above. So. Yeah. The, 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 the downfall of computers and their intelligence is that they lack visual intelligence. So, um, if you gave Connor a picture to see, a, you gave Connor a picture of a dog and a cat, and you, you told him to say, which one is a dog and a cat? It would take him three seconds, maybe. It would take me two. Hmm. Oh, you would be smart your pants. Now, if you gave the whole thing to a computer and told, tell me which one's a dog and which one's a cat, it would take probably half an hour. Because... Think about it. You know dog and cat from an invariant memory in your head, or your neocortex, stored of this is what a cat looks like and this is what a dog looks like in general. The brain, I mean, a computer has no idea what either one is. So you might say and program it, look for this kind of nose size. Look for these kinds of ears, these kinds of eyes, these kinds of legs. How long of a tail does it have? And even after all that, it still might get it wrong. And that's why the main downfall of computers in this visual intelligence and why it's so hard to replicate is visual intelligence. Now I'm sure we're all very confused. Is there any questions from the crowd? Questions from the crowd? Ah, uh, yes, you. You in the hat. And our first question. And what's your question, sir? Uh, my first question is, are animals intelligent? 
Great question. Thank you for that. The uh, the short answer is yes, and I'm gonna tell you why. That's because they have a neocortex, and anything that is intelligent has a neocortex. Do we have any more questions? Uh, we have one more question out there. All right, here's our next question. Nay, what is human intelligence different with animal intelligence? Uh, that's that's also a great question. I'm not sure what's going on with your head with the uh, the horse thing, but we're not going to worry about that. Um, the main difference is just the fact that the human neocortex is larger than any other species on the planet. The horse took my apple. What? <laughs> what? Uh, the horse took my apple when we were on break. <laughs> we're going to have to deal with that later. Okay. Me will sure replay that later. And language, really, sir, is what gives us and really drives us to have more advantage over animals because animals aren't as advanced in language as we are. And we are so much more adaptable than animals in that we ex uh, What does adaptable mean? Being able to adapt. Okay. You got that? Yeah. Okay. And it causes us to really just try to exploit the structure of the world more. <laughs> and I, I hope that that answers your question. Oh, great. Someone has another question. You, Carlos. All right, we have another and hopefully our last question. What is consciousness? I, did you, I think he said consciousness, right? Mm-hmm. Really? It sounded like a carbonaceous little small. This English is an expert. Okay, great. Um, so, sir, consciousness is basically what it feels like to have a cortex. If, if we simplify it as much as possible. Now, you might say, well, things that don't have a cortex are conscious. Well, yes. But to feel that you are conscious, you really need a cortex because it's breaking down into two sectors. Qualia, which I'm not going to talk about because it's more complicated than anything we've talked about today. And self-awareness, which is basically, I know that I'm conscious. And again, we go back to the, the thing before that our bodies are part of the external world. So when you're conscious, you're thinking your body and mind and soul are really separate from one another. And your cortex has no ability to render itself. It doesn't know what the brain looks like. You don't know what your brain looks like. Do you know what your brain looks like? Mm, I do. Like, specifically. It's pink. Thank you. So, this is really the fact that our thoughts appear independent from our bodies. And therefore, we feel like we are a separate consciousness. Or we have a soul. Which, really, we do. It's the neocortex. It's our ability to independently think of things and keep them in our brain without it physically being attached to our body. I hope that answers your question. And there is one more question from Harike, and let's go to him. Our next question comes from Harike. Watch. This the question should be answered. And Mr. Child of Bag, can you please tell us your question? My question is, will we ever build intelligent machines? And if we do, will it be safe? Okay, we will answer the question back in the interview. Well, Enrique, um, I see you're working out. That's, that's very good for your neocortex. Um, will we build intelligent machines? Yes. Yes, we will. Undoubtedly. Will they look anything like the Terminator? Or anything we've seen in science fiction. Absolutely not. You never know, though. No. I'll be back. They will. They will look they nothing. Like they might be. Are you in it? Who's the expert? Excuse me. We've been running this for 20 years. I think we know what we're doing. Clearly. So, if you wanted to build an intelligent machine, you went on Wikipedia. You said, I don't like build an intelligent Wikipedia machine. Wikipedia is a lie. Correct. If you went on it, Wikipedia, Google, and um, you asked, how do you build an intelligent machine? It would tell you this. It would say... The first thing you have to do is you have to give it senses. You have to give it an ability to detect the world around it and understand what's happening. The next thing is you have to give it a cortical hierarchy system for its memory so that it can process everything and understand it. Then you have to train the memory system through repetitively showing it the world, just like you would with a kid, so it would understand what's happening. And lastly, you would have to then just let it sit and evaluate the world as it see it's seen it. And the really big issue with doing this in should we build them is connectivity is going to be a huge issue, which is where 
you have all these things happening, well, in your brain, it all makes sense organically why it's all connected and how it's all connected because it's evolved over time to do it itself, basically. If we're trying to replicate this, going back to the plane and bird thing, we're not going to do it and create a physical brain. So we have to connect all these wires in a way that they check each other and create an audio associated memory system and with invariant memories. And should we build them? Yes, we should. And they will be, the, in my opinion, the least dangerous and most beneficial tech ever created. Oh, but you don't know that for sure. And they will not seek to destroy the world like the Terminator because they will not be given the ability to have emotions. They will strictly have a neocortex but nothing else. Because again, they don't need to know muscles. They don't need to know emotions. They need to know, here's a memory, process it, store it. And that's it. And I think we have one more question from Jose. Let's go to Jose. The last question is from Jose. Why are machines beneficial? Well, Jose, that was a great question. Don't you agree? I would say that was a great question. So why, will it, why are, are intelligent machines going to be beneficial? And they will just flat out surpass human intelligence. Because we are, we are, our brains are flat out restricted by our skull. We can't get bigger than that. The cortex can only get so big. We could build a mega cortex, in theory, in a machine that takes up a warehouse. And it will really surpass us in four main areas. In speed, in capacity, and replicability, and in its sensory system. So for speed, it's going to be a million times faster than the human brain because it's going to have that much more space. That is very fast. It's quite fast. And then going back to the space, <coughs> its capacity is unrestricted. It can be as big as it wants, or as big as we want it to be. And with replicability, if we make one, we can make 20,000, because it's the same structure over and over again. In the span again. of what year will this be coming out? I cannot predict that. Soon, in the future. I say within the next decade. Uh, I'll be waiting. Mm -hmm. And lastly, in sensory systems, because if we create an intelligent machine, we can connect it to everything. And it can be connected to the weather systems, to data from all over the world, and it can take all this and start forming bigger predictions and bigger inputs, and it can start daydreaming. And then we can start using that as our information to start tapping into. And um, with that, I think that answers our final question. All right, and that was our last question of the night, and thank you for being on our show. Thank you for having me. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it, and I, I hope you learned something. Good night, America. We love you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for tuning in to tonight's episode of The Jack and Connor Show. Be sure to tune in next week to see Jack and Connor interview newly announced presidential candidate, William Hope.